I'm happy to welcome John Reed, um, coming all the way from Australia to be here with us during this weekend. Um, there are many things for me to say about John, but I think I will not talk too much to say thank you for your stubbornness and your dedication and your brightness and for never ever giving up. So this is John Reed. So first talk in 20 years without PowerPoints. You're, you're, you're honored or, or something else, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, I'm supposed to be talking, apparently, about the real causes of madness and whether or not um, the paradigm shift is happening. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that, but every, every film I see and every talk I see changes the talk I want to give. So just, just seeing Jackie there reminds me of um, what I think is probably the highlight of my entire career, uh, which is in 2008 being invited from New Zealand to speak to uh, the first 100 psychiatrists who were starting the training in how and when to ask people about child abuse. Um, and I made sure that Jackie Dillon was with me for that, and I bored them to death for three hours with research about the relationship between childhood trauma and poverty and everything else. And then Jackie talked to them all afternoon about her life story, and I sat behind and, and watched the tears. And I know which bit they will remember. That's not to say that the research isn't important because they could not dismiss Jackie as some sort of odd individual person when I had just given them figures of millions and millions. Um, and Terry's film made me want to talk about um, some more about the loss of uh, love and the role that that plays in our suffering and, and, and madness. And, and to remind you that the DSM-5 has just eliminated uh, grief entirely from, uh, from the world, which is a wonderful thing to be able <laughs> to, be able to do. Um, in the 1980s, you had uh, the version of the DSM, you had six months to grieve after the loss of a loved one before you could be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Uh, from 1994 onwards, that was reduced to three months. So you could grieve for three months, but on day 91, if you were still upset, you had major depressive disorder. Uh, DSM-5, it's gone. You, there is no time to, to grieve after the loss of a loved one. You have major depressive disorder if you meet the criteria. On the very uh, generous basis, they argued that um, we wouldn't want to deprive people of the benefits of our, our treatments by saying they didn't have major depressive disorder, they were just grieving. Isn't that nice of them? Um, Another thing about the loss of love, um, bit of, so there will be a bit of research in this talk, not too much, hopefully, um, is there's two studies showing that people my age, over, over 60, um, when they lose the uh, lifelong partner, 80% of them will hear or see that person in the next year. So the question then becomes, what's wrong with the other 20%? And... and <laughs> And I assume the drug companies are working on a medication for, for those 20% to, to help them um, <laughs> be more normal and be able to experience their, their, lost, their lost partners. Um, so the actual, the actual causes, um, Peter has touched on them already. Um, the actual causes you can summarize in one line, um, which I've been doing for 30 years. And the, and the line is, bad things happen and they fuck you up. <laughs> and... Um, it's astonishing that a person like me can make an entire career <laughs> out of that one idea. And it's even more astonishing when you realize that everybody already knows that. Um, because uh, there's research been done in 22 countries asking the public what they think causes psychosis or schizophrenia or whatever you want to call it. And in 21 of those 22 countries, the public says bad things happening and they fuck you up. They say poverty, loneliness, isolation, child abuse, child neglect, stress at home, stress at work, unemployment, and so forth. Um, we don't need a contest for which country got it wrong, because um, it's a country that gets absolutely everything fucking wrong. And, 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 um, but to be fair to the public of America, they, and, and no offense, Laura, or 
uh, other Americans here, David, um, they are bombarded with incredible amounts of propaganda from the drug companies, which does eventually um, have an effect, it, it seems. So the public know, um, it is important for us to remember when we're feeling a bit lost in the struggle, the public are already on, on, on our side. The list of actual causes, um, I could read them out, but this is, the, the, oh yes I will, because I'm supposed to be doing some research based stuff, aren't I? So it's maternal, prenatal health and stress, birth complications, rape and physical assault, war combat, child, sorry, I'm supposed to be speaking slowly, aren't I? Child abuse, <laughs> child neglect, parental loss, bullying, poverty. Uh, there's no point, is there? I mean, we know it's like bad things happen and they fuck us up. Um, there's another perspective, of course, that some of what we're talking about is a natural variation on, on human life. Some people hear voices without bad things happening, and perhaps we just don't need to do anything about that at all. In fact, this battle between biological and social um, happens only in the developed world. In the developing world, most people aren't really interested in the causes of voices, for instance, because it's just a part of life. Um, it's only in the Western world that we get into this battle between what causes these things. Um, so, interestingly, um, so we've got that the public understand um, that these, these things happen and, and cause us distress and voices and everything. Um, people who have the diagnosis themselves, when you do research on them about their causal beliefs, they have even stronger psychosocial um, position than the public in general. And my favorite study, or at least the response to it is my favorite, was a study of 306 so-called typical schizophrenics from 10 countries, um, whatever typical schizophrenic is. 97% of them did not believe they had a biological illness of any kind. They rejected the medical model. Um, this was conducted by some, what some people call the dean, the dean of schizophrenia research, Robin Murray, in, uh, in UK. This position of the 97% of people was immediately dismissed as lack of insight, which apparently is a symptom of their illness and proves that they do indeed have a medical illness called schizophrenia. And just recently, in the last four years, they have discovered the part of the brain that causes this lack of insight and given it a name called anosognosia. Level of arrogance and stupidity in that is astonishing. There is a part of the brain that causes you to disagree with your psychiatrist. <laughs> and it is a symptom, a symptom of the illness that your psychiatrist knows you have, but you think you haven't. The, the layers in that are, are just beyond belief. I think it's, I think it's sad, this, this miscommunication between a, uh, that happens probably a thousand times a day, is happening right now in various parts of the world, where a, a very distressed person comes in with a view that they've had some things happen in their life that they'd like to talk about. And another person who's very caring, who's very intelligent, highly paid also, um, who, who believes that what they need to do is listen just enough to count the symptoms, pick a label, and then pick a color. How does that take seven years training, by the way? I mean, that's, that's the, you could go on a weekend course, couldn't you? On, 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 on how, but it is, it's sad because the miscommunication there is, is there, there is no communication. Um, and which why people tend not to get better, but that's the nature of the illness, of course. So I'm supposed to be talking about the research. Um, most of the research I've done has been in the area of, of childhood abuse, which is, um, was quite controversial when we started 20 years ago. We were told we shouldn't research this. Um, this is family blaming, and it's going to upset a lot of people. And um, of course, we were really only trying to identify what is actually going on in, uh, in families so that the family could get some help. Um, because nine times out of 10, if a parent is doing bad things to their child, you can be pretty sure that that parent needs some help and pretty sure that they had a pretty rough childhood themselves. So we are talking about breaking into generational patterns of um, difficulty taking care of children well, I think. Um, anyway, I'm also supposed to be talking about paradigm, so I'll do that briefly and then stop. Um, this is the ongoing issue that we all keep asking ourselves, especially those of us who've been at it for 40 years or so. 
are we on the edge of the paradigm shift that we all pray for, which is a little bit like waiting for the Messiah, isn't it, really? If you've been, if you've been the second coming of the Messiah, well, yeah, the first coming actually would be nice. Um, but, uh, so I'm going to ask, I, I will try and answer it, but the, but the bottom line is I don't know. But I do this a lot around the world, it just helps me figure out where people are at. I'm gonna, how many of you think in your part of the world that in the last 10 years things have gotten better in mental health services? How many think it's about the same as it was 10 years ago? Oh my God, how many think it's getting worse? Shit. Okay, the paradigm is not about, <laughs> about to happen. Um, there's pockets, aren't there? There's pockets of, there's certainly pockets of hope and there's pockets of excellence and, and the stuff that people like Peter and Anne are doing in Britain. The British psychologists are just doing wonderful stuff. But there's people all over the world doing wonderful things, sometimes in isolation until we all come together. And so I want to end by trying to instill a little bit of, of hope. Um, a guy called Thomas Kuhn wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which you, some of you will know in, in the 1960s. And he talked about the conditions that were needed for a paradigm shift. And he started with the academic stuff, the science stuff. And he said, we need uh, scientific revolutions come about, paradigm shifts come about when, uh, first of all, the current dominant model is unable to answer the key questions that it is supposed to answer. I think there's no doubt that we've reached that, that point. The medical model cannot answer uh, any of the important questions like uh, why do people become distressed and what they need. And they haven't got any etiological theories that have any evidence behind them. They make stuff up like chemical imbalance and genetic bananas. And, um, and none, of it is, none of it has been um, supported with evidence. Um, and the second condition is that new information comes to light that does not fit with the existing paradigm, and we've certainly got that. We've met that criteria in terms of all the evidence that, around trauma and abuse and poverty, which doesn't fit the medical model. Um, and then there's a condition I'm not sure we've met yet, that we need an alternative paradigm. And that's where we'll argue, because we'll all say, I've got it, I've got the alternative paradigm. So John Reed will say, trauma is the paradigm we need, and other people will say, no, it's not, it's something else. Um, and maybe the answer is that we need to learn that we don't need paradigms. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> not, not because I'm anti-science, but because the human mind and human condition doesn't fit paradigms very well, because we're actually driven mad by different things and in different ways. And there isn't an answer to what is the cause of madness, I don't think. Anyway, this guy, Thomas Kuhn, went on to say, if those conditions are met, Scientifically, it still won't matter because the people owning the old paradigm will fight tooth and nail to protect it just because they've been involved with it for so long. And so actual scientific change doesn't come from science. So that means I've been wasting my life for the last 35 years doing, doing all this research. Um, not really, because it is important, but um, what, what he was trying to say is that paradigm change comes from struggle and fight, and people outside the scientific community um, working hard to, to bring about that change, which is why it's so nice to be with all of you. So I'm going to end with a few quotes from different parts of the mental health system. Um, and I'll start with um, a, a study, a survey we did, just three quotes from people in New Zealand um, <clears throat> that we asked about this at the time, seemingly odd idea that we should ask everybody who comes into mental health services about what happened to them, especially in their childhood. That we should specifically ask about childhood neglect and abuse. And here's what uh, some examples that I use in the training that we do. There was an assumption that I had a mental illness and because I wasn't saying anything about my abuse, nobody knew. There were so many doctors and nurses and social workers and I'm sure psychologists, in your life, asking you about the same thing, mental, 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 but not asking you why. I just wish they would have said, what happened to you? What happened? But they didn't. And I think it's kind of hopeful that this elephant in the room is now being spoken about. The elephant in the room 
which is not talked about for decades, the role of the drug companies in our mental health system, in our research, and so forth. Um, so 10 years ago now, these are just two short quotes from some very brave heads of psychiatry organizations, starting with the head of the American Psychiatric Association in 2005, who said, if we are seen as mere pill pushers and employees of the pharmaceutical industry, our credibility as a profession is compromised. As we address these big pharma issues, we must examine the fact that as a profession, we have allowed the biopsychosocial model to become the bio, bio, bio model. I wish I'd said that. <laughs> Head of the American Psychiatric Association. That's, that's going to give you a bit of hope, hasn't it? Uh, meanwhile, in the same year, his British counterpart, part, Professor Mike Shooter, put it a little more succinctly when he wrote, I cannot be the only person to be sickened by the sight of parties of psychiatrists standing at the airport desk with so many gifts with them that they might as well have the name of the drug company tattooed across their forehead. <laughs> and it's good, isn't it, that psychiatrists... And so that is beginning to change a little bit. And I don't blame the drug companies, that's their job. Their job is to make money for their shareholders, isn't it? Um, but where is the professional boundary? Where's, where's psychiatry? When did it forget what a professional ethical boundary is between itself and the, a profit-oriented organization? Okay, three more quotes and I'm done. Because um, this issue of is there a paradigm shift going to happen depends entirely on us and whether we give up or not. Um, and I don't experience many people at meetings like this have any intention of giving up. Um, but sometimes, just as uh, in therapy, uh, clients uh, and people who've been through difficult times talk about how important it is for the therapist or somebody to hold hope for them. Uh, we have to do that for one another on a, on a broader sense. So just as a way of keeping us going, a couple of quotes. One from Antonio Gramsci, um, who wrote, while imprisoned by Mussolini's fascist regime about keeping his faith, by thinking of himself as, quote, a pessimist by intelligence, but an optimist by will. I love that. I love that. He urged us, quote, to live without illusions and without becoming disillusioned. Um, one more from Cornell West, who's a civil rights activist, or was a civil rights activist. He said, hope calls for a leap of faith that goes, quote, beyond the evidence to create new possibilities based on visions that become contagious. These visions allow people to engage in heroic actions, always against the odds, no guarantee whatsoever. And my very last one comes from my ultimate hero, uh, and it's especially for Peter, because Peter's about to become president of the British Psychological Society, um, which we're all very excited about. Uh, this is George Albee, who was head of the American Psychological Association and spent his entire um, career telling us clinical psychologists off for being at the bottom of the cliff. Why are you always trying to put people back together instead of putting energy into primary prevention? We know what causes these things. We know it's abuse and neglect and poverty. Where are the psychologists and the mental health professionals fighting that battle? And he wrote... This is my final quote. Psychologists must join with persons who reject racism, sexism, colonialism, and exploitation, and must find ways to redistribute social power and to increase social justice. Primary prevention research inevitably will make clear the relationship between social pathology and psychopathology, and then, will work to change social and political structures in the interests of social justice. It is as simple and as difficult as that. Thanks very much. <laughs>